Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for coming out to Grown Up Story Time. Uh, this is going to be absolutely fantastic. I am going to be your host tonight. I am your resident, and your next reader is. My name is Dedder Dennis Mal. I am a comedian here in Boston. Uh, just to let you know, we are going to be doing a storytelling show where some people oh, have written stories. Other people will be reading those stories. It's going to be a fun time. Some stories are going to be funny, and we're going to have laughs. Some stories are going to be sad, and it's going to hit you emotionally in the core, right here in the deepest, darkest regions of your heart. So if that happens, awesome. That's what we're aiming for, okay? Let you know a little bit about myself. Uh, one of the things I want to let you know is that uh, just starting off with a small story, a small story. The small story I can give you right now is I was kicked out of Catholic school as a child. And the reason I was kicked out is I made a nun so mad she slapped me in the face because I would not stop singing the lyrics to Fiddler on the Roof during class. <laughs> Uh, I know it's tax season right now, uh, and I uh, know this because the uh, state of Massachusetts just sent me a letter uh, asking me to confirm my identity because they didn't believe I turned in my own tax return. Which would be great if I was getting a tax return. <laughs> I owe them, and they're still like, yeah, we don't believe you're you. Like, they asked for proof of identity, I just sent them a picture of myself with today's newspaper. <laughs> Sad part is they rejected it, and do you know how many hours it took me to find a newspaper? All right, we're going to get right into the show. We're going to give you a couple of warnings right up front, okay? So first and foremost, please turn off your cell phones. If you have a cell phone, uh, please turn it to do not disturb or silent. Or if you're the fun type, vibrate. You know what I'm saying, okay? Because nobody wants to hear your Cardi B ringtones during the show. We want to hear Cardi B. We just don't have the money to, uh, to, to uh, uh, we don't have the money to play Cardi B on this show. That's basically where we're at. We do not have the royalty rights to Cardi B, okay? Anything else uh, is subject to uh, suspicion. So, all right, again, like I said, we're going to have stories that are funny. So laugh when it's appropriate. Cry when it's appropriate, okay? And I'm going to tell you this. The way some of these shows work is somebody's going to come out and say, guys, are you ready to have a show tonight? And you're like, yeah. It's like, come on, you can do better than that. And you're like, yeah, two times as loud. And they're like, come on, Somerville Media Center, I can't hear you. And then you're like, yeah, and you're three times as loud. Let's skip the bollocks. Every time I ask you to applaud for one of our readers tonight, let's just go three times loud right off the bat. Can we do that for, you, for me? Yeah. This man already knows. There we go. That's all right. Let's keep this going. Our first story is going to be called A Smurf Stole My Gatorade. It is written by Sarah Matthews, whose superpower, by the way, is giving the perfect kitten belly rubs. And it's going to be read by the math lover. Uh, please give it up for Allison Turner, everybody. Slightly taller. Have any of you gone on a run to blow off steam? Like, maybe you had to redo three PowerPoints at work, or some jackass hollered abuse at you from across the street, or the person who invited you out stood you up and left you waiting at a coffee shop, and you sat there for an hour sipping on a pumpkin spice latte that had too much pumpkin and not enough spice. Anyway, Something sets you off, so you go run your angry heart out, and by the time you get home, you're a jelly-legged blob of sweat and exhaustion. The first thing you'd want to do is you'd want to drink something cold, right? And the last thing you'd want to do, well, the last thing I wanted to do was deal with a pest in my house. Maybe a couple of you have been in that kind of situation, gotten back home, wiped out, and then found a roach skittering out from a corner, or mouse droppings littering your silverware drawer, or heck, a sparrow stuck in your chimney, tweeting, panic, and scattering feathers all over the hearth. It has to be dealt with immediately. The exterminator needs to douse the floor in anti-roach spray, and mousetrap needs to sit ready in the corner. Someone has to go into the chimney with heavy gloves and a towel and catch that bird. But my pest wasn't your garden variety mouse. You see, the sky was a dusky orange by the time I staggered into my condo. I was sweaty and aching all over, and my throat was dry as sandpaper. So I went to get some Gatorade. I figured I'd grab my drink, as I usually did, and then spend the next hour limp on my couch. My legs would stick to the fabric. I wouldn't care because my spine would melt into the cushions and the water and electrolytes would taste like relief. I'd kick my shoes off. 
I wouldn't even turn on the television, just close my eyes and savor my Gatorade and the quiet of my own home. But I got into the kitchen, and there was this six-inch tall blue creature on my counter. Holy shit, a Smurf. <laughs> that was my first thought, and I'd keep thinking it because he was freaking blue. But the creature's resemblance to a Smurf stopped there. He wasn't half as cute or half as human looking. He was stout with proportionally long arms and large clawed hands, and he was butt naked, except for the hair that covered him from head to toe. He had wrinkly, flat fangs. And I could see the fangs because they were latched to the rim of the plastic bottle, a bottle with a familiar logo on the label. Somehow, that Smurf had gotten his paws on my Gatorade. His dark eyes glinted at me menacingly as he drank it. I thought for a second that I was hallucinating, that my fatigue-addled brain had pulled some crap out of my subconscious and plopped it in front of my eyeballs. Then. He bared his teeth and growled at me. And I realized I was not nearly imaginative enough to make this up. Maybe some biology lab was. Maybe the little guy was a science experiment. Or maybe he was an alien. I didn't know. All I knew was that he had stolen my sports brain. My post-run dose of hydration and contentment gone to a creature that could barely lift the bottle. I pointed at the Gatorade and told him, I was going to have that. He narrowed his eyes, hugged the bottle to his chest, and said, mine! <laughs> I hadn't expected him to answer, truth be told. But once I let reality sink in that, yes, the tiny blue troll thing could speak my language, and yes, he and I could probably carry on a conversation, I asked him what any reasonable person would ask. Where did he come from, and how in the blazes had he gotten into my condo? The Smurf looked at me like I was stupid and pointed to the window. It was ajar. We were three stories up, and that window wasn't anywhere near a fire escape. So I pressed him for more information, but he wasn't exactly forthcoming. How had he scaled the wall? Climbed! With what? Sticky gecko pads? Claws! Could he speak more than one word? Yes! Would he? No, big worm snot beast! I couldn't tell whether that last answer was stupidity or sass, but it was rude as hell, and I was done. This blue pest had broken into my home and stolen my Gatorade, and now he was calling me names. He had to go. I reached for my cell phone, figuring Animal Rescue could deal with him. But then I realized if I called them saying a Smurf had broken into my condo, they'd think I was nuts. They'd hang up on me, and then they'd spend the rest of the day making jokes about the whack job who must have hit the liquor too hard. I'd have to deal with this myself. I yanked the bottle from the Smurf's grasp, and I told him to get out. Those dark, beady eyes of his widened. His ears flattened. His shoulders hunched. His lips drew back. His coarse hair running along the back of his spine like a frightened cat. The Smurf shook his head adamantly and backpedaled towards the edge of the counter, and oh shit, he just stepped into thin air. He teetered on the edge, his arms windmilling, and then he screeched bloody murder, tipped over the edge, and I dropped the Gatorade, dived forward, my hands outstretched. My elbow banged on the side of the counter, my stomach smacked the floor. My knees collided with the kitchen towel. Ah, oh, damn it! I needed those kneecaps to run. Something warm and small fell into my open palms. The screeching petered out. The Smurf sat in my hands and blinked at me like he couldn't believe what he was seeing. It hit me then how small and fragile he was. Thieving menace he may be, but I could squash him under my boot. A hawk could pluck him off the ground and carry him up to its nest. A garter snake could swallow him whole. Assholes yelled at me sometimes, but at least they were my size. What kind of crap did this little guy have to deal with? I tipped him into one hand and used the other as leverage to stand back up. The Smurf latched onto my thumb and kept saying, down, down, down! So I set him on the countertop, figuring he'd feel better if he got his feet back under him. He sat in the middle and hugged his knees. The Gatorade had rolled across the floor. 
I walked over to it, picked it up, and offered it to him. It wasn't like I'd be drinking it myself anyway. He'd gotten his Smurfs alive in it. He accepted it hesitantly, like he thought I'd follow the gift with a threat. That made me feel uncomfortable, guilty almost. I didn't make it mean to make him think I'd, I don't know, eat him. I went and got myself a mug full of tap water and then pulled up the counter stool and sat across from him. I drank. A moment later, so did he. We sat there for a while, me and the Smurf, drinking and eyeing each other silently. We'd reached an unspoken truce. The Smurf wouldn't snarl at me and I wouldn't toss him out. Eventually, the sur Smurf swallowed the last drop of Gatorade. He held the empty bottle and I recycled it. I made a bed for him, just a folded up blanket for him to crash on, nothing fancy, but he seemed to appreciate it. He barred his teeth in what I think was supposed to be a smile, although those needle sharp canines made it look menacing, and then he curled into a tiny ball and he closed his eyes. It was the strangest thing. I'd gone running angry. I'd gotten home tired and, let's be honest here, still angry. It was just muted, you know? masked by all the fatigue and rush of endorphins, but simmering underneath. And this Smurf had brought it back out. That roiling, volcanic, I'm so done with people's bullcrap kind of fury. But just then, in that quiet moment, with the little guy curled up on a blanket, I didn't feel angry anymore. One more time for Allison Turner! Uh, my favorite part about that story is it takes place in a condo, whereas I live in an apartment in Alston, so if there's a Smurf in my apartment, it's a rat someone spray-painted blue. <laughs> Three times as loud. Are you guys ready for your next story? Yeah. Somerville Media Center. Your next story is entitled Charlotte. It is written by sci-fi fantasy and fiction writer Michael Luna, and it's going to be read by the man who I guarantee you his real name is McCool. Put your hands together for Jason McCool! Once upon a time, a knight, clad in chainmail armor and intent on avenging the cows of his local farm, marched inside a cave to find the culprit, your typical green European dragon curled up like a cat, snoring. The knight drew his sword and shouted, Awaken and fight me, foul beast! The dragon furrowed its brow, its fan-like ears drooping, and its emerald eyes fluttered open. As it glared at the ceiling, ignoring the night, the dragon muttered in a Brooklyn accent, Can't a girl get some sleep? She yawned, flashing her fangs, and then cracked her neck before rising to her feet and stretching out her arms. Oh, man, she groaned, cocking her head from side to side. I was dreaming about eating those frigging cows from a week ago and shit, and now I gotta, huh? She glanced down regarding the night. Oh, hey, what's up? said the dragon, yawning again. She rubbed her left eye with her left claw and then yawned a third time, shaking her head as if to clear it. <gasps> Woo! Excuse me. The dragon blinked a few times as she withdrew her left claw, rubbing the back of her neck. Let me guess, she said, snorting. You're, uh, you're one of those uh, dragon slayer dudes, right? the dragon's eyes still looking glazed over as she glanced around her cave. The knight sneered at the dragon and proclaimed, I shall drive my blade into your hide, you scaly abomination. She laughed. Whoa, <laughs> slow down there, Casanova. At least take me out to dinner first, Jesus. 
Do not take the Lord's name in vain, the knight shouted, shaking his fist. The dragon arched a brow at him and said, Who? The Lord, he shouted again. The dragon's eyes widened and she began nodding. Oh, she said, squinting for a moment. Oh, yeah, the uh, chewy looking guy who was a carpenter and then ironically got nailed to a... Ah, uh, yeah, I got you. The dragon smirked. <laughs> no, I, uh, I actually meant Dragon Jesus. Dragon Jesus, the knight responded, his eyes widening as he took a step back. Yeah, said the dragon, shrugging. What, you never heard of Dragon Jesus? The knight shook his head. Oh, come on, man. Fed 5,000 with a cow and two sheep? walked on a rainbow to go visit his aunt, raised his friend Larry from the dead on a Tuesday, was betrayed by his landlord Jeffrey for 30 pieces of chicken. You're telling me you ain't never heard of Dragon Jesus? The dragon stared at the knight, waiting for a response. Forgive my ignorance, but no, I haven't, he said, shaking his head again. Oy vey, she said, rolling her eyes. Well, that explains you barging into my cave and waking my scaly ass up from one of the best friggin' naps I've had in three friggin' months. The dragon sighed, shrugging again. But, eh, you know what, she said with a smirk. Awkward introductions aside, Tin Man, you seem like a pretty nice guy, so I'll let it slide. The knight's eyes shifted back and forth, and he said, Um, thank you? The dragon nodded, No problem. <laughs> then she glared at him and muttered, Now put your dinky little sword back in its scabbard, and then sit your ass down and listen. The knight sheathed his sword and sat down as instructed. Thank you, she said, nodding and smiling. Now then, the dragon cleared her throat and began, <clears throat> I hate to have to tell you this, but your life is about to be ended, not by me personally, but, well, you see, she sighed and shook her head. We dragons run a very neatly organized, albeit tightly wound, global crime syndicate. We snatch up some cows from local farms when we're hungry, we burn down villages that show us disrespect, and some of us, usually the guys, have this weird-ass fetish for kidnapping princesses for some ungodly reason. But hey, I ain't here to kink shame, okay? If some bozo gets off on distressing damsels, that's their business, not mine. But anyway, Mr. Knight, because of your profound disrespect, coming in here and waving your little sword around like you're some unfunny clown here to bemuse me, one of our goons has most likely witnessed this display and put out a hit on you and your village, both of which are destined to have what we in the dragon community like to call an unfortunate accident. Oh, dear, said the knight staring down at the floor of the cave. Exactly, said the dragon, throwing her arms up in the air. So, at this point, Pavarotti, you really only got two options. She held up her right index and middle talon to designate his choices. Either you get whacked and we burn your village to the ground, she said, wiggling her index talon to indicate this first scenario, or option B, she continued, cocking her head to the side while shrugging. You and the rest of the village people run and eyed like scared little bitches. She squinted for a moment, straightening her neck and bringing her claws together as if in prayer, adding, and in this scenario, we'll also burn your village to the ground. The dragon let out a nasal exhale as she rubbed her claws together before lacing her talons and crouching to get eye level with the knight, muttering, What I'm saying is, either way, we're gonna burn your village to the ground. Her eyes narrowed again, and she said, Capiche? The knight's eyes widened, and he gulped, asking, Is there really no other way? Well, said the dragon, 
standing up straight and folding her arms across her chest. Technically, there's a third option, but... She smiled, shaking her head, and then she glanced down at the knight, saying, You ain't gonna like it. What is it? he asked, springing to his feet. Please, you must tell me. The knight begged her, clasping, clasp, clasping his gauntlets together. Well, she said, cocking her head to the right while glancing upward, the Dragon Mafia has recently started a new, let's call it, outreach program. The dragon looked down at the knight, then looked back up before continuing, twirling her right claw as she rattled off the details. Thereby creating a sub-organization within our larger cow-snatching, village-burning, princess-kidnapping network. She examined the talons of her right claw, saying, We call it the HDFC. The HDFC, he repeated, blinking several times. Yeah, she said, nodding. It stands for the Human Dragon Fighting Club. The knight blinked several times again. And what's that? The dragon looked at him with a deadpan expression on her face and said, Come on, dumbass, ain't it obvious? It's humans and dragons fighting each other. And it's the club. <laughs> I see, said the knight blinking several times once more. And, uh, how does that help my situation? He asked, eyeing her at an angle. The dragon shrugged and replied, Simple, we go to the club, you fight a couple of mooks, earn a favor from the dawn, who will then put a cloud of protection over you and your village. A cloud of protection, the knight repeated, furring his brow. Is that a spell of some kind? The dragon rolled her eyes, sighed, and said, No, dumbass, it's just a figure of speech. I see, said the knight, rubbing his chin with his left gauntlet. So, how soon can we go? Oh, oh, uh, well, right now, I guess, she said, glancing around her cave. First, just let me get changed. The dragon smirked, letting out a puff of air through her snout. Oh, wait, that's right, she said, rolling her eyes. Dragons don't wear clothes. The dragon chuckled, saying, you folks should try it sometime. It's actually quite liberating. But anyway, let's go. Thank you, I really appreciate this, said the knight as he walked alongside her. Ah, yes, he said, his right index finger springing st skyward as he and the dragon entered the cold night air. Forgive me, my lady said the knight with a bow, but I never asked you your name. She closed her eyes for a moment and then stared up at the cerulean star-filled sky, chanting, My name is as old as time itself. It witnessed the formation of the stars and the birth of the earth. Really? he said, his eyes widening. Nah, I'm just screwing with you, said the dragon, flashing her fangs in a grin. The name's Charlotte. Charlotte, he repeated, rubbing his chin with his right gauntlet. Yeah, Charlotte, she said, nodding. What's yours? Oh, yes, uh, the knight cleared his throat and said, <clears throat> My name is Sir Edward Thaddeus Maximilian. Charlotte laughed. <laughs> Away! Oh, hey, I didn't ask for your life story. Jeez. The dragon snickered, shaking her head. Oh, and hey, uh, Eddie, she said, eyeing him at an angle. I actually wouldn't mind it if you really did take me out to dinner, you know? Uh, are you sure that wouldn't be inappropriate? Asked Sir Edward, his eyes widening. Charlotte sighed and rolled her eyes. Well, that depends, she said, folding her arms across her chest. Is there a Mrs. Pain in the Ass? Oh, my God. No, okay, I'm not going to do the voice. It's... My favorite part about that story was uh, figuring out which part was the fiction, uh, dragons or Jesus. Oh, yeah. oh, a lot of Christians in the room? Okay. Sorry. I didn't realize it was, uh, that uh, Catholicism was your guys' habit. All right, let's move on to the next story. 
Uh, our next story is an excerpt from the Xerox monologues entitled Bernard. It is written by Clark University playwright Margaret French and is going to be read by someone making their grown up story time debut. Please put your hands together for Kat Murphy! I am a librarian. What they don't tell you when you sign up to be a librarian is that much like the bartenders of the world, you end up doing a lot of listening. I'm there to provide a service after all. Why shouldn't that mean a half an hour of you pouring your heart out while I pretend it takes a half an hour to put a hold on the new John Grisham novel? This is what your tax dollars are paying for, after all. So if this is what you want, hey, I get it. The only real bummer is that in a library, you're not supposed to drink. You do get used to it. After a while, you begin to compartmentalize your attention. I am a very good at performing menial library tasks while people tell me all about their divorce hearings, report cards, and the weird infection they think is spreading across their feet. It's not that I don't care. I love talking to people, and listening comes with the territory. I'll even remember to ask you how you're doing next time you come into the library. But at this point, I consider myself mostly immune to the sob stories and weird shit. Here's the thing. No matter how skilled you are at multitasking, no matter how hard you focus on the incredibly boring, repetitive, and critically important library tasks, saving you from having to make extended eye contact from the person on the other side of the counter, it is possible to be caught off guard and unprepared. It always starts out innocently enough. A quick question, a book suggestion, help with the printer, one of our regular patrons, an older gentleman named Bernard, was able to do this quite easily. On this particular day, he announced his entrance with a cheerful song hummed just loudly enough that everyone on the first floor could hear it clearly. This should have roused my suspicions, as Bernard was normally a bit of a grump, but I carried on at my desk preparing story time crafts, <clears throat> blissfully unaware that he was preparing to pounce. We engaged in our usual banter as he made his way over to the copy machine. Often Bernard asked to borrow a ruler so he could resize copies proportionately and demand I check his math. Today, however, he wasn't trying to stump me, just to narrate his journey. Meanwhile, at my desk, I filled my quota for red and orange construction paper squares. I made the executive decision to keep cutting. Bernard eventually finished his one-man performance of the Xerox monologues and asked to borrow a highlighter. For five minutes, it was quiet. Far too quiet. Afraid to look up, I kept cutting. I had enough paper squares to do the same story time craft four weeks in a row. So I only felt relief when he cleared his throat and waited at the front desk. I immediately stood and met him there, thinking only of how grateful I was that he paid with a dollar bill instead of pennies, as he sometimes did. He took his change. <clears throat> he stood. He waited. He cleared his throat. Instinctively, I reached for my security blanket of construction paper and scissors. They sat useless on my desk. What a tactical error! A freaking rookie mistake! Do you believe in aliens? He asked. Now, when you work in a public library, you aren't supposed to share your opinion on controversial topics, political things, and so on. I couldn't for the life of me figure out if the existence of aliens fell into that off-limits category or not. Bernard didn't wait for an answer. Instead, gleefully holding up his photocopied and highlighted and annotated pages, did you know there was an alien abduction right here in town? I could answer this one honestly. No? In that no, I tried to convey every 
ounce of disinterest I possibly could without sounding rude. Unsurprisingly, Bernard did not care. Clearing his throat one more time, he began to read from the photocopied pages. Word for word, I wish I were kidding. I am not like Bernard. Unlike Bernard, I'm not here to waste your time. Although I still remember way too many details about this story, I will simply summarize some quick highlights and the commentary Bernard so thoughtfully provided. His read aloud took half an hour. My retelling will not. You're welcome. This abduction took place in the 60s. A local mom noticed aliens outside her window and went out to say, hi, and or get off my lawn. They froze her family in place, abducted her, examined her, and sent her back home four hours later. Her freshly thawed family, of course, remembered nothing. Very conveniently, neither did the woman until she underwent hypnosis almost a decade later, when she decided that not only were these aliens trying to spread a message of love, but they might actually have been God. Yup. Welcome to alien abductions in a small town. Bernard wanted to know if I believed in aliens. He wanted to know if I believed this story, and if this is what I thought alien life would look like. He also wanted me to agree with his outright dismissal of faith communities, blame politicians for driving aliens away, explain my thoughts on the role of sexism in the abduction, and listen to his own theories about what really happened to this woman. He was so committed that when someone came to needed to check out their books, he stepped aside and kept talking. If you work in any form of public service, you know someone like Bernard. And you know there's often a real reason why they've taken the however much of your time. A punchline, if you will. Bernard loves a good punchline. I have a present for you. He said he handed me his photocopies and receipt with a flourish. Come to think of it, I did buy this from the library book sale yesterday. Just think this could have been in your collection who decided to get rid of a gem like this he gave me a pointed look even though I'd had absolutely no say in the matter I want you to have the photocopy for reference in case anyone asks I thanked him and he hummed himself out almost immediately my boss rose from the corner of the room where she had been sorting magazines. This whole time, she hadn't made a single move to save me. As she passed me to head downstairs, she smiled sympathetically and pointed to the pile of paper at my hands, then at the recycling bin. You know you don't have to keep that, right? She asked. I tossed the paper. But actually, it might have come in handy because not two months later, a woman called asking about the same alien abduction story. I ended up ordering the book from the local library because there was absolutely no way I was going to call Bernard and ask to borrow his alien book. She's a natural, we're gonna keep her. Give it up again for Cat Murphy. We've reached a halfway point and I can't think of a better way to kick off the second half of this show than with the story called Diary of a Minecraft Dad. It is written by award-winning humorous and not the brag, personal friend of mine, Stephen Brickman. And it's gonna be read by the creator of the Humans Behind Ads podcast. Please put your hands together for Paul Dome! All right. Diary of a Minecraft Dad. Though my 10-year-old's obsession with Minecraft first took hold three years ago, back when Minecraft was all the rage, I have to hand it to him. He's sticking with it, despite the imperialist hegemony of Fortnite. What's more, he's not a fan. Too much violence, he says, despite his affection for Nerf guns and laser tag. It all began 
when some friends came by with an iPad and a teenager. Well, we catch up, my friend said. Henry can show Gus all the stuff he's building in Minecraft. It sounded innocent enough. Little did I know that one visit would destroy the very fabric of our family. Hey, Dad, Gus asked the next day. Can I download an app? It's only four ninety nine. Coincidentally, his aunt had just given him an iTunes gift card, so who was I to say no? <laughs> it's your money, I said. Do whatever you want. Five minutes later, he was laughing at the iPad. I felt good. For once, I had done the right thing. I allowed him his freedom. Little did I know, the game had already taken it away. Little did I know that it would be the last normal conversation my son and I would share before I lost him forever, literally down a mine shaft. <laughs> Hours later, he remained unmoved on the couch, still chuckling at the device. <laughs> what are you watching now, I said. Still playing Minecraft, he shouted over the din of his earbuds. <coughs> <coughs> I choked on my coffee. Uh, what would my wife do when she caught wind of this. We had not discussed whether or not downloading Minecraft was okay. I, um, I began formulating counter-arguments. My first line of defense would be to deny culpability. I didn't know what he was downloading. No good. Uh, what parent would let his kid download something without knowing what it is? Is it better to play the nostalgia card? Let's not overreact here, I'd mansplain. Don't forget. You had an Atari 2600 growing up, and when I was seven, I had some weird triangular Coleco thing. I spent my childhood days rotating a giant knob in order to hit a green square with a rectangle. <laughs> but it was different back then, my, uh, the wife in my head replied. That was all we had. It was novelty to everybody. Touché, imaginary wife, touché. As is often encouraged in parenting books I've read the jackets of while waiting for my family at the mall, <laughs> it is best to show some interest in your children's activities. So I took a seat next to Gus on the sofa. <laughs> wow, I said, looks cool. Kind of pixelated, uh, retro-y, yet futuristic. Want to see my house, Gus said? That's my bed. A bed in a video game? How raunchy does this game get? <laughs> uh, Gus, why do you need a bed? Duh, so I can sleep. And that explained nothing. Do you have to make the bed? Wash the sheets? Of course not, Dad. Then I realized something. Even though this was his first solo game of Minecraft, he somehow seemed to know everything about the game. Uh, Gus, I asked, not wishing to appear dumber than I already did, uh, didn't you just download Minecraft this morning? How do you already know so much? Reading, Dad, they have books in the library. Plus, we played at Noah's. Ha, ah, I breathed a big sigh of relief. The fault was not m entirely mine. I could pin the rap on the Damascus. A family so adorable, nobody could ever stay mad at them for everything. <laughs> so, what's the score? I said. I asked. <sighs> There's no score. Uh, how do you know who's winning? Nobody wins in creative. You just play. <laughs> how many uh, lives do you have left? I said I'm in creative. Well, wh what does that even mean? It means you just build stuff. How many blocks do you get? As many as you want. And then it hit me. No wonder Minecraft's so addictive. It's a socialist fantasy where all players contribute to the infrastructure, and in return, nobody ever goes hungry, and everybody lives forever. Want to play? Truth be told, I did want to play. But I held back because, like a professional gambler or an obsessive collector, my grandfather and father respectively, I stopped playing video games after I figured out the reason I flunked out of med school. Prince of Persia, Mac OS 1993. <laughs> only recently have I allowed myself brief bouts of Nintendo Wii, and only because I have to stop every twi 20 minutes to use my inhaler. <laughs> Friends with similarly addicted children have tried to be reassuring. It's not as bad as some other games, they say. 
It's social, at least. Sort of. And creative. Our house is now full of Minecraft paraphernalia. Books. Legos, night lights, swords, and stuffed animals, none of which anyone could identify the species of without an extensive contextual familiarity with Minecraft. One stuffed animal just looks like a giant green erections, testicles and all. Thousands of years from now, the plastic action figures will be dug up by futurist, future archaeologists who rack their brains unraveling their significance. And I haven't even mentioned the videos. One morning, Gus and Nora were fighting over the iPad when a new voice filled the room, an English man's voice. I got a creepy feeling. Uh, Gus, I asked from the kitchen, are you like playing Minecraft over the internet or something? Oh, we're watching a video. A video of Minecraft? Yeah, this guy's awesome. His name is Dan TDM. Actually, Dan TDM is apparently so awesome that if you type DA in the YouTube search bar, what you see first is Dan TDM. I clicked, a sinking feeling rising from my bowels, and read The Diamond Minecraft. 1,706 videos. 9,251,825 subscribers. Footnote, these numbers have since riven risen to 2.9 thousand videos and 20 million subscribers. Holy f <laughs> I said reflexively. <laughs> Minecraft, five secrets about Dan TDM has 21 million views. Second footnote, now, now 41 million. How the hell did he get 21 million views? By being awesome, that's how. Sorry guys, I just, I, I, I don't, I just don't know, I'm not sure how to process this. I looked back on everything I'd done and suddenly realized my life was nothing more than a series of thwarted efforts. Getting thrown out of medical school, moving to LA, getting laid off by the National Lampoon, then moving back to Boston and finding six years of digital commie wiped clean from the website as if it never existed to begin with. When all I ever had to do was play video games. <laughs> now here's the next big question. Is my boy technically addicted to Minecraft? Let's look at the facts as enumerated by Medical News Today. <laughs> Number one, person takes the substance and cannot stop. Things have gotten so bad, our only effective punishment is withdrawal of Minecraft. Such threats result in everything that occurs with addiction. Moodiness, bad temper, poor focus, a feeling of being depressed and empty, frustration, anger, bitterness, and resentment. Number two, symptoms of insomnia accompany withdrawal. On weekend, Gus wakes up before sunrise to play Minecraft, Minecraft or watch videos. Number three, addiction continues despite health problems. Gus's thumb is blistered <laughs> and sore as a result of playing. Nevertheless, he chooses to suffer. <laughs> Number four, social and or recreational sacrifices accompany addiction. The other night, Gus stated he would much rather stay home by himself playing Minecraft than see his sister perform at their high school. Though this should come as no surprise to anyone. <laughs> Number five, user diligently maintains a good supply. Gus is hyper vigilant about plugging in the iPad at night in order to ensure it will be fully charged come the morning. Number six, user takes risks to acquire substance. The boy frequently steals the iPad without asking to, without asking to sneak in a game of Minecraft. Number seven, user needs substance to deal with problems. Gus's happiness is directly proportional to the time spent playing Minecraft. Number eight, obsession with substance with substance. It's all he talks about. He literally counts down the minutes to the time he's finally allowed to play. Ten minutes till Minecraft. Number nine. User seeks solitude and acts in secrecy. On more than one occasion, Gus has hidden beneath a blanket secretly indulging in Minecraft. Given a choice, I feel confident he would much rather hang out with Minecraft than with either of his parents. Though again, 
that should come as no surprise to anyone. Number 10, user denies having a problem. Far from being a problem, Gus sees Minecraft as a solution. Perhaps the solution to boredom, interpersonal relationships, you name it. The final verdict, 100% addicted. Here's the facts. Gus is better equipped to survive in the Minecraft world than in the real one. Which leads me to my next theory. Some sort of higher power is behind all of this. Some alien presence or non-physical entity who's totally in charge and knows exactly what's going on. And these virtual worlds are training camp for the youth, preparing them for the day when the planet becomes uninhabitable, when it becomes impossible to survive outside in the air, assuming there you know, is any air. When, there, when this time comes, the physical world will be placed by a virtual one. And everyone will live in individual pods, trademark, where all our basic biological needs will be taken care of. Nutrients and water and oxygen in, waste and CO2 out. Immobility will be the trade-off for immortality. These kids will be the last generation to inhabit the earth, since no one will be able to have actual sex. But they will live forever, together in their addictive virtual kingdom, just like in Minecraft Creative. Case in point. One YouTube Dan TTM video was imbued with a green haze that kind of flickered on and off. I assume it had something to do with how it was streaming, but my kids said no, that it was a, quote, potion haze, quote. Okay, that makes sense. Except, you know what else it looked like? A subliminal coded message from the aliens. My kids are in a potion haze, all right? Keep crafting. Everything will be fine if you just keep crafting. One more time for Paul Doom, Stephen Brickman, and the Diary of a Minecraft Dad also known as Ready Player One Part Two. Uh, all right, our penultimate story, which means it's the second to last, our penultimate story is entitled Layover. It is written by a switch salesman from Austin and is going to be read by a Somerville resident who's on the hunt for the most perfect craft beer. Please put your hands together for Jacqueline Torres. Her hotel was in downtown Chicago. Outside, the snow fell in a relentless wave over the city. A single suitcase rested on the dresser next to the television and the password to the Wi-Fi. In the corner leaned her guitar in a leather case with a sticker on the neck of a lightning bolt. Steam from the shower spread from the bathroom into the covers of the bed that would be made again in the morning by someone else. A calm voice, discerning, relaxing, and smiling, as if this was the most natural thing in the world, as if humanity were meant to live above the clouds a fleeting moment like condensation on the windows. If only everyone kept their blinds open for the sun and the moon, but when they slept, she played her guitar in the galley, the ripples of the ocean like the wrinkles in her flight attendant uniform. Her callous fingertips move along the strings, and she heard a song near the engines. She dressed in jeans, boots, a flannel shirt, and a puffy jacket. She grabbed her guitar case. The lights never turned off in the hallway, the doors were all locked, and some were asked not to be disturbed. Her hand touched the fake plant for the texture, the cold elevator button, the golden doors open, and she stood alone, surrounded by mirrors, until she landed in the lobby. She walked across the marble floor, set to leave through the glass doors, made heavy by the wind. She walked until her hand froze, and then a blue and pink neon sign pulsated over a brick face, an open window. Maestro's bar, open mic. The arrow pointed to an alley. She crossed the street and disappeared between the Goliath Towers. Snow blanketed the dumpsters, the puddles fro frozen over, the red bricks a dismal opaqueness interrupted by the light bulb over the metal green door opened by a young man with a cigarette. He wore a, yellow, a leather jacket, dark jeans, black boots, his black hair caught the wind, and he had light brown eyes that looked her up and down and fell on the guitar. He put the cigarette behind his ear. You here for the open mic? Yeah, is there any way I can play? He smirked. You want to play for these goons? Be my guest. We got an open slot now if you want to jump on. I'll talk to the bartender real quick. It's freezing out here. I'm Tim. Abby. They shook hands, 
Smoke collected among still fans. Two men played on pool tables, scarred from missed shots with warped cue sticks. She walked among the chairs scattered from their tables like everyone had cleared out in a hurry. A stage faced the window and looked out to people trudging through a cold night. A loud, hoarse voice said, Of course you can play. What do you think? We got a line? For fuck's sake, Tim, it'd be a miracle if anyone showed up tonight. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't let people smoke in the bar, replied Tim. Gary ignored the young man and went back to cleaning a glass mug with a dirty cloth. He was bald, the hair displaced among his forearms. He stood tall enough to grab the liquor bottles from the top shelf that collected dust, rose like steps in front of a dirty mirror. The two men playing pool whistled at a shot. One man towered over everyone, with a belly falling over his pants, held up by suspenders. He had long white hair, tied into two ponytails, and cackled between his cigarette puffs. What are you guys complaining about? Now we get a private show. Tim had grabbed a cord from behind the bar and walked over to the stage and said, If you ever paid your pad, Paul, we wouldn't need another customer. The fourth man had a hunched back, a drooping face, and wore glasses styled like aviators. He wore a Chicago Cubs hat, green fatigue pants, and a gray button-down shirt with heavy sweat stains around his armpits. He looked at Abby and politely asked, Excuse me, miss, are you lost? She turned a guitar at an empty table, looked at him and said, No, I think I'm all right. Gary slammed the bar. Come on, David, you're going to scare away my business. David looked at Gary and shrugged his shoulders, his wrinkles turning into a smile that showed a set of perfect fake teeth. What are you talking about? Look at her. She looks like an angel. If God comes looking for her, he's going to be pissed she wound up in this dump. I only got a few years. You see me making enemies? Paul adjusted his suspenders. If God comes into this bar, he's going to have to answer a few questions about the bears this season. <laughs> David and Paul laughed. Jerry looked at his empty bar, sighed, and looked at Tim, who grabbed a stool and hooked up the lamp and microphone. He went to a light switch and flipped on the spotlight. You want anything to drink yet, Angel? It's Abby, and I'm all right, but maybe some water? You got it. Jerry poured a glass of water from the tap. He waved Tim over. Grab us some beers, kid. Paul pulled over a chair for Tim. Tim set the bottles down for the men, and Jerry pulled out cigarettes for them all. He offered one to Abby as she sat down on the stool in the dim spotlight. No, I'm all right. The four men looked at one another and fell silent as her fingers landed on the strings, and she spoke into the microphone. One, two, three, four. People gathered outside like window shoppers. One by one, they came inside of the cold world to listen. Gary had to leave to tend to the bar. Tim had to run up a keg from the basement. More people came in, so Paul and David got up to make room and help behind the bar. Their tip jar filled up and had to be changed every hour. No one else came to play, and she became the bar instead of a fixture. Instead of handing out snacks and drinks, she gave her voice and her songs that invoked thunderous applause as she paused and tried to remember old songs from places she had been, places she had forgotten, and the new places she would see in the coming morning. The time came for her to stop, but by then the sun had begun to rise. The four men were tired and rich. As she packed up her guitar, Tim walked up to her and asked, What do you want? She smiled and said nothing. Abby walked out of the bar and vanished into the sky. All right, keep this applause going. Don't stop it. This is our final story, and I can't think of a better way to end it. It is going to be entitled Ida's Granddaughter. It is written by longtime story writer for Grown Up Story Time and advertising exec Diana Lebrecht. And it's going to be read not just by one of our best writers, but also the young lady who puts this whole show together every month. She runs workshops. She's the, the uh, person who brought Gus to Boston. And I'm proud to bring her to stage. Put your hands together for Colleen Moore! Sometimes a part of your life has been with you for so long, it's hard to remember when it began. The weight and consistency of it has a permanent space somewhere inside of you, and looking back, you can't recall if it appeared there suddenly or it just grew quietly over time. That's how I feel about my grandmother's Alzheimer's. A long time ago, Alzheimer's didn't belong to her, and I knew nothing about it. And now, what feels like a lifetime later, the woman she is battles against the disease that fiercely pulls at her knowledge and memory. I turn off the car's engine in the parking lot of the assisted living facility where she resides. A chill goes through me as I look up at the pale yellow stucco two-story building. I sit without moving and stare straight ahead. I take deep, slow breaths, and I practice making my voice light and airy. 
After eight years of pills, doctors, nurses, surgeries, and a move from Boston to Boca, things have changed. She's now in hospice care, and this will be my last visit with her. Ida is in the corner of the dining room, right next to the windows. Her eyes are closed, and she's leaning back in her wheelchair. Her feet hover on pedestal extensions below her, and like a queen sitting on her throne at the end of her reign, she looks tenderly at ease, but tired. I pull a seat up and take her hand in mine. It's wrinkled and slender and bruised from arthritis. I call out her name a few times as I rub her arm and then say my own. Her light blue eyes flicker open and she yawns as she fights to keep them from closing. Can you stay awake for some lunch, I ask. Her eyelids slowly close again and she rests her head back. She's smaller than I remember from four weeks ago, more compact and pale. Her once thick, long auburn hair has dissolved into a thin covering of gray and white tresses, just inches each overlapping on top of her head. She's wearing an oversized light green cotton zip-up sweater and matching pants. Colorful beaded necklaces and gold chains hang from her neck, partly covering what looks like coffee and juice stains. Ida's deep Italian skin is patched with light brown age spots and thick wrinkles, and her narrow lips are ashen and twitch as she rests. Hot lobster bisque soup has arrived, and though Ida's eyes remain closed, her mouth opens and, and reaches forward. There have been visits where she rejected the food, cursing and shouting, and my reaction is to smile at this too. The fight in her still sparked. Rain starts to fall outside, lightly at first. Then a South Florida heavy downpour makes the walls tremble. In her old house on Weatherby Drive, Ida had an indoor screened-in porch made of mahogany wood we called the rain room. Whenever it rained, we'd sit on the porch with tea and cookies playing go fish. After a while, the rain would tint the wood to almost black and the sweet, fresh smell spread throughout the house. During our visits, Ida wouldn't let me sit around. We'd always be playing a game, exploring her attic, or out on a drive. She was active and passionate. Before each visit, she would assure us that we'd do something special and fun. The only memories I have of her napping are from recent years. Ida wakes up again and looks right at me. For a moment, I let myself believe that she can really see me. I gently touch the spoon to her lips, and she accepts it. Accepting help is hard for this woman who traveled around the world multiple times and ran her own home for the last 30 years. She worked her whole life with an adventurous start of joining the Women's Army Corps against her father's strict demands at 18. Ida's father gave her an expensive fur coat in exchange for her promise to not work for the Corps. The same night she got the coat, she crawled out of her bedroom window and joined. The coat was passed down to me, and whenever I put it on, I feel like I'm looking out in the world through my grandmother's strong eyes, and I can take on anything. Cataracts and glaucoma took her eyes several months ago, and I sit beside her in a bright colored dress in a desperate final attempt for her to see me. Her arm hurriedly reaches forward into the empty space next to her, and I gently move her hand away from whatever it is she's fighting to grab. When I was young, at the end of each visit, she would ask, are you doing something you like? And the importance of the question didn't come to me until later. Grandma might not always understand what I was studying in school or the details of my jobs, but she always wanted my life to be filled with enjoyment above everything else. She understood that it takes time to find fulfillment and that I didn't need anyone's approval but my own. She would always ask if I was seeing anyone special, but assured me there was no rush. She said the right one was just around the corner. Grandma understood the thrill of the love and thrills of youth. After all, she married her husband after just six weeks of dating. 
Ida was selfless. Each visit with her was planned by for her guest. Their wishes became her own, and she made us feel loved. Whether she was giving me painting lessons or when I got older telling stories of the men she knew before her husband, I knew that this time spent with her was special and fun and mine. In between naps and mouthfuls of soup, she sighs and her eyes drift toward the windows. Are we laughing? She asks. For a moment, I let myself believe that she was still there. Would you like to laugh? I dimly respond and push through the clarity of her question. She turns to me then and shrugs her shoulders with a smirk. Always, and you should too. The sound of a distant piano slides soothingly into the dining area. Ida has fallen asleep again and a short mutter escapes her mouth. She could be reacting to a new dream or more likely the growing discomfort of her sensitive old body. When I was younger, and her condi condition was just a mumbled family rumor at holiday gatherings, I didn't know what losing someone slowly looked like. At 17 years old, I had only known sickness from a distance. There was no time to ask why or how. The adults reminded me not to cry in front of her. I quickly learned to stand in the back of the room and listen as decisions about our matriarch were made. Her diagnosis and its limitations soon redefined who she was. The abrupt chain of events angered and confused her. Her life had shifted without her consent and she didn't understand how the new pieces fit together. Anger moved to depression. She began to yell less and cry more. The battle to keep her driver's license slowly faded, but her attempt to keep last week's dinner fork grew. The last day I stopped fighting, her condition was a few years before it went from bad to worse. I was still fighting for her, the real her, to last longer and not be touched by the illness I read about. We were in a Massachusetts park with a photo album and slowly turning the pages together. And I'd gone through a couple of the pages, pointing out who was in each one, her two sons, their wives, their children, us. When her turn came to say who was who, she grew anxious and quiet. Still, she smiled up at me with twinkling blue eyes. We had turned back a page and I went through each face again, tapping each body slowly as I said their names louder. She turned to me, her face resolute as she touched a finger to my sibling. I watched her eyes squint and focus, her mind searching to find the correct answer, her mouth unable to form a full name. After a few moments, she closed the book her eyes filled with defeat and confusion. She took my hands in hers and apologized. I realized right then that if I didn't let go of the woman she had been, I would never be able to take care of who she was now. Smiling back at her, I pulled her to her feet to go for a walk in the sun. As my grandmother lets go of her battle, my memories won't be of her paranoia and depression or helping her walk or pressuring her to take her medicine as she yelled at another round of nurses. What I will remember is her comforting warm smell, her love for dessert, her handmade knit blankets I still curl up in, Italian operas, Jimmy Connors, and Days of Our Lives, and all the other ways she enjoyed the sweetness of life. Later, as I stepped into the elevator, two nurses move aside so I can get in. I press the lobby button, even though it's already lit up. One nurse gives me a friendly nod. Who are you here to see, sweetie? Ida, I reply. Relation, she asks. The other nurse answers for me. 
Oh, yes, you're her granddaughter. You're visiting at a good time. I gently wipe in my eyes and nod back at them wordlessly. I hold back my tears and smile because that's what my grandmother would have wanted. Keep it going again for Ida's granddaughter. Written by Diana LeBrock and read by our Grown Up Story Time own Colleen Moore. Keep that applause going. That is our show for tonight. Thank you guys so much. Please keep the applause going for all our readers tonight. Jacqueline and Allison and Colleen and Paul and Jason and Kat and all our writers and most importantly Somerville Moody Center and you guys for being here. Thank you so much. Follow, find us on Facebook. Grown Up Story Time. Hashtag support local artists. Thank you guys. Good night.